coming up this week on call with Insignia. It is important for both the government and businesses to have a common understanding of the issues or the reasons behind why certain regulations exist and the considerations. Uh, and for both sides to be open-minded to discuss alternatives. And I think well, one useful way is to know where to get the resources and the help that is needed to establish a common understanding. Like having a global outlook and having experience in different markets actually is a very key success factor uh, for many businesses. So PEP does not differentiate between local and foreign entrepreneurs. Uh, as long as you have a good business idea that is based in Singapore, uh, we will be happy to help you. Hi folks, welcome back to On Call with Insignia, where we go on call with leaders innovating the future of Southeast Asia, or as we like to call it, as innovation. I'm your host, Paolo Pina, and we have a you know, very special guest with us today. As you can see, uh, for those tuning in and watching the, our, our video podcast, we have Inglan co-hosting this episode with me because we have a guest from leading an institution that is very near and dear to his heart. So uh, I won't delay any further and hand over the mic to Inglan to introduce our special guest today. Yeah, today we have a very special guest indeed, as what Paolo mentioned. Typically, we have VCs, investors, founders. Today, we have a, a very special person, what we call a super civil servant in Singaporean parlance, a high flyer in the Singapore civil service, but also someone who runs the organization that's very close to my heart called the Pro Enterprise Panel, which I've been privileged to serve as a member for almost eight and a half years, if I remember correctly. You retire after 10 years, so I said, one and a half years of serving in this great organization. So I, I'd love to introduce Liu Chen, who is our Director of Enterprise Development Division at the Ministry of Trade Industry in Singapore. She is a rock star in the Singapore Civil Service. And I think the Pro Enterprise Panel has really been transformed under her. Lots of good initiatives. I think Pro Enterprise Panel is, is a panel that not many people know about. So I will leave it to Liu Chen to actually share more and I can also chip in with some views. But thanks for being on our show, Liu Chen. I think not that many people appreciate the Singapore Civil Service and the efficiency and the innovation that in the police. So I'd love for you to introduce yourself and how that led you to becoming a director at MTI in a few sentences. Yeah, thanks, Inlan. Uh, thanks for having me on this show. So I'm Liu Chen, the Director for Enterprise Development in the Ministry of Trade and Industry, and also Secretary to the Pro Enterprise Panel. I've spent about 12 years in the civil service, covering various portfolios from manpower to housing, transport, and now enterprise development. I also spent a year on Sukhumen to Shell, driving their electric vehicle charging business. So that was in 2020, a very exciting time at the start of COVID. So... Ingla has been on the PEP for longer than me, so I will also, this is really just a, a dialogue between the two of us. I try to introduce PEP and you can also feel free to chip in to talk about your experiences, uh, especially from the earlier years during your time in PEP. Thank you. Thanks for being on our show. So let's zoom in the Pro Enterprise panel. For those who are not familiar, Liu Cheng, maybe you can tell us what is the role of PEP in Singapore's situation landscape. I think some of the initiatives at the first mover framework, the new idea scheme, and some case studies, I think that would be a good start. Okay, so the PEP, uh, Pro, Pro Enterprise Panel, is a private public panel that is chaired by the head of server service, the Liu Ip, and comprises business leaders as well as senior public sector officers as its members. The panel is supported by a secretariat that is housed in MTI and also a network of pro-enterprise partners or we call PE partners from across 34 different public agencies. So these are really people who are passionate about driving change and bringing positive impact to the companies uh, that approach the PEP. Uh, the PEP's aim is very simple, is to identify and address regulatory challenges that businesses face in various stages of their growth, from startups to the medium-sized companies, SMEs, to even the large established companies. Uh, so if you have a problem, come to us and we'll try to help you regardless of which sector you are in, uh, which stage of growth you are in, uh, etc. And we do this through three schemes. So the first one is the PEP suggestion scheme, uh, which gives our businesses an open platform to provide feedback on regulatory related issues. So since you asked for examples, maybe I can talk about uh, Bringjai Brew, which is what they call themselves a nano brewery because they are so small, they are not even microbrewery, they are nanobrewery. So they provided feedback that the existing licenses for microbreweries did not really meet the needs, uh, did not make sense like, for boutique players like them. Because in the past, an annual microbrewery license cost $8,400. And it was just too hefty because players like Bringjai only made around 10,000 liters per year. So that works out to be almost a dollar, almost a dollar per liter, uh, which is a very big part of their cost. 
Uh, so PEP and Singapore Customs uh, acted on this feedback. Uh, today, microbreweries like uh, Bringjai and all other microbreweries out there actually, instead of paying $8,400 upfront, they pay $2,100 per quarter in the first year. And they even can get a refund if they decide to close down their business and give up their license early. So this lowers upfront capital commitments for our budding entrepreneurs so that they can test their products more quickly and then decide what to do with their product, whether to expand it, make it into a much larger business or close down and move on to something else, to pivot to something else. So that's the first one, the PP suggestion scheme. The second scheme is the first mover framework, which supports entrepreneurs with innovative ideas to test bed their ideas via a direct allocation of government assets. So most typically that will be state land or industrial space. So I'm not sure whether you've heard of tiny away homes on the southern islands. So that really was running on the tiny house wave in the US and Australia where some five years ago, if I recall correctly, they first established in Australia, helping to build this tiny hotel uh, house on farms, vineyards, so that these landowners can benefit from the rental that's generated. And having proved that viability of the infrastructure overseas and having quite a robust business model already, so Tiny Away fitted into the Sentosa de Development Course plans to rejuvenate the Southern Islands. So through the first mover framework, they will allocate a piece of land to build their tiny away homes on Southern Islands without having to go through the tender process, which I think a lot of people will know that in Singapore, most of our land is actually tendered out through competitive bidding. But in this case, we have the advantage of being able to directly allocate land without having to go through tender for projects and companies that meet a specific set of criteria. You must be a first mover. It's never done before in Singapore. It's a very innovative idea. You just need something short term to test it. So that's the second one, the first mover framework. The third scheme is the new idea scheme. So where regulatory agencies will work with businesses to set up regulatory sandboxes to test bed their ideas in a more controlled environment and risk mitigated environment. Uh, so for example, I think uh, many people have heard of DriveLa, which is a P2P car sharing platform. So for this case, we worked very closely with the Ministry of Trade and Industry, Ministry of Transport and also the Land Transport Authority to implement a regulatory sandbox under the new idea scheme for drive lab to test bed their, their idea. Previously, under the LTA's private car rental scheme, private car owners can only rent out their cars out on weekends and on public holidays. So through this sandbox that is championed by a drive lab was able to offer their cars for rental even during weekdays with certain parameters of the sandbox. So now I think they have a fleet of, of a few hundred vehicles that are being actively rented out even today. So to recap, the PAP is a community of leaders and practitioners who are passionate about driving change to make Singapore much more pro-enterprise. Uh, and we facilitate businesses in three ways. The PAP suggestion scheme, the first mover framework, uh, as well as the new idea scheme. So for those who are listening in to this podcast, I would like to call on all the entrepreneurs out there. If you have an issue that you are facing with a regulatory agency or any issue that you think you will need help growing your business, do come to talk to us. We can be reached through our website, our social media platform, through email, etc. Those are great Thanks. examples. I still remember doing the drive la video. Ah. So add one more example, which is close to my heart because I suggested it and it won the Go Award at the Public Sector Pro Enterprise Initiative Award. The suggestion I had many years ago was this VCFM, the Venture Capital Manager Regime Framework, which as a VC, and actually there's many VCs listening to the podcast. One of the things that impeded VCs from setting up in Singapore was the licensing, which took quite a bit of time. So one of the proposals we made and MAS took on board was to lower the, the time it takes for the authorization process of VC managers to support mm. the startup ecosystem. So I think that was very well received. In fact, we used to be on this license until we graduated out of it. And I know at least 20, 30 other fellow fund managers that benefited from this scheme. I think it's not just for entrepreneurs, but in this case also for, for professional VC investors like us. And then actually, and there are many others that stood the test of time. So last weekend, uh, I just took my family for, vac uh, for a duck tour. And I ah. told them that uh, this, is the, this is a very interesting vehicle that can float in the Singapore River and go on the land. And you actually have to clear many government agencies because if you go to yes. the, the sort of the grass is M-Parks, you go to the road is LTA, 
And then I think another agency for the sea, for Singapore River. PUB. Yeah. yeah, PUB, that's right. So that, I think actually PUB has touched my life in more ways than I remember. But I actually wanted to come back to, Duck Tour was a while back and even the VCFM was 2018. Uh, I wanted to come back to this and to Liu Chen and maybe get your thoughts on some trends you've seen in terms of what yeah. businesses are working on that cause more, more regulatory agility, regulatory innovation as a result of the work that you do at PEP. And what are some of the interesting things you are seeing, at least for the public ones uh, that, that we have approved, <laughs> then uh, you can talk about? Yeah, so I think one of the really emerging sectors that we are seeing today uh, that there's a lot of talk and action about is the green economy. So it is a very important pillar of the future of our economy, and not just for Singapore, but also globally. And of course, it's a very important part of our longer term net zero plans for Singapore. But because it is such a nascent sector, it is not a very not so much of an issue of uh, having regulatory hurdles, uh, but very often not having clear regulations in the first place because it's so new. And some in some instances, not having any regulation at all. Which is why there are, there's a lot of interest, uh, a lot of ideas out there. Uh, some people find it difficult to execute uh, because there is no regulation. They don't know how to, uh, what boundaries to work within. Which is why we have last year, about a year ago, we launched the Green Economy Regulatory Initiative. So that was launched at the PEP SBF Awards last year. In short, Jerry is a one-stop sandbox platform that makes available information on all of government's existing sandboxes related to the green economy and also sets out a very clear process and timeline for setting up new sandboxes. So some of you who entrepreneurs who have dealt with government regulations in the past may know that you probably have to spend a lot of time navigating a lot of government websites, checking in, calling the hotline to figure out about a particular uh, regulation or, or, or the parameters of a particular sandbox. And if you could like engage in conversations and discussions with agencies for sometimes uh, a month or even a year about setting up a regulatory sandbox, and eventually you're told that hey, actually it is a no-go. Uh, it's a lot of wasted uh, efforts uh, and also a lot of business ideas uh, couldn't go to fruition because of regulatory issues. So under Jerry, we have actually the PEP gathered together more than 20 different regulatory agencies and got all of them to commit to lean forward and take a facilitative approach to set up sandboxes with a very expedited timeline. So instead of spending months or even years negotiating a sandbox, within 30 days after receiving a complete proposal, our agencies have actually committed to provide a provisional decision on whether to continue discussions to build a sandbox. And in the next four to six months, maximum six months, the sandbox should be up and running. This actually cuts the amount of time and effort and resources that's wasted quite significantly. And under Jerry, there are eight focus areas that we are mainly interested in. So things like hydrogen, carbon trading, circular economy, electric vehicles. So they are all part of the focus areas. But of course, if there are other ideas from other domains, we'll be happy to take a look as well. Uh, and so far, we have seen quite a number of very interesting proposals, some a little bit more preliminary, some are actually quite close to commercialization already, which we are, the team is working with the agencies to evaluate now. So we hope that some of these projects can grow into big businesses, business ideas, uh, and eventually benefit uh, Singapore and Singaporeans. That's great. And I also wanted to go back to your bit of your background you had. I think the civil service is quite forward-looking to send you to Shell. And having worked there at the Shell EV initiatives, and actually not many of the listeners may know, your role also involves having supervisory insight for a very powerful organization called Enterprise Singapore. Uh, <laughs> and also in your role in assisting with PEP, how do you see some of these PPPs moving the needle in terms of green economy innovation? Mm and some of the enterprises working in this space? Yeah, that is a very good question. Actually, the government is very open to leverage PPPs when we believe that the private sector participation can add value to the delivery of whether it's public services or infrastructure or financing options or even knowledge expertise. So we have had many PPPs in the past, some more successful than others. So maybe in the area of green economy, one of the PPPs I can think of is Class Nexus, which is a project, I think, between NEA, the National Environment Agency, and the Private Sector Consortium 
to develop an integrated waste management facility in Tuas. So that facility will use advanced technologies to convert waste into energy and also other useful products. And it's expected to reduce Singapore's carbon emissions by up to 200,000 tons per year. I think there are a few other PPPs out there, whether it's in the green economy or other areas. But beyond PPPs, especially based on my experience in Shell, it is very important that for some of these nascent sectors, for government to provide a clear strategy or a plan a roadmap to give the private sector the confidence to make investments into a particular emerging area. Uh, as businesses, the uh, private sector, they have the resources and expertise and they want to bring some of these ideas to fruition. But sometimes the lack of a government direction can hinder their decisions. So in the case of EVs, it was very helpful that government made a very clear announcement to phase out ICE vehicles, internal combustion engine vehicles by 2040 in Singapore. So that really gave the industry confidence to go in, create concrete business plans, sinking significant investments to help both the government and also industry itself to achieve the goal in a commercially viable way. So during my time in Shell, we negotiated the partnership between Shell and Porsche to build a, a, a network of high-power char EV charging infrastructure along the North-South Highway in Malaysia. So that links the whole network of Shell high-power EV chargers in Singapore all the way. I think now they're up to KL and eventually they'll go to Penang and hopefully one day link to China <laughs> all the way. So that's quite exciting because it's very unprecedented, this kind of intra-country charging network where everything is interoperable. Even the payment and everything is interoperable. And actually, I had a friend who was daring enough to drive his Tesla from Singapore all the way up to KL and back quite recently. And fortunately, both him and his Tesla are safely back in Singapore now, relying on some of the EV chargers along the way. I think your experience was great. I wanted to get you to share your views after spending time in both mm. private sector and also working closely with ESG and PEP. What one-line advice would you give founders or entrepreneurs when it comes to working with government organizations, given you have been on both sides? So I think the, the very first fundamental thing is neutral understanding because regulators are not there to create barriers for the sake of creating barriers and making life difficult for entrepreneurs. That, that's very far from the truth. So it is very often they have reasons or concerns related to safety, security, or, or fair competition, consumer protection, etc. So it is important for both the government and businesses to have a common understanding of the issues or the reasons behind why certain regulations exist and the considerations. Uh, and for both sides to be open-minded to discuss alternatives, don't be so stubborn on the single way of working, be flexible to adjust the proposals to achieve, even if not win-win solutions, but at least mutually acceptable outcomes. So I think that is very fundamental. And during my time in Shell and also now working in the economic portfolio, I find that common understanding is very often not there, not quite there yet. And I think one useful way to go about establishing that common understanding is to know where to get the resources and the help that's needed to establish a common understanding. PEP is one channel, obviously, and we welcome you to reach out to us anytime through any of our platforms. There's also Go Business, which is a one-stop platform for all the government business transactions. So this is a joint initiative by MTI and GovTech. So GovTech has developed the platform. You can think of it like a SingPass app, but for businesses, where throughout the company's life journey, almost all the interactions that you ever you have with governments can be found in one form or another through Go Business app. So that's from pre-incorporation where you can do research, uh, find information about the sector that you want to go into, the business you want to go into, the different business formats within a particular sector. And then once you've made up your mind about roughly what to do, uh, you want to incorporate a company, so that can be done via the Google Business Platform. And, and then subsequently, when you're ready to grow your business to internationalize, there's a suite of available business grants and support schemes that also can be applied through the Google Business Platform. I think now that that is a uh, fantastic platform to get uh, all this information and you will actually receive personalized guidance each step of the way by entering uh, a few simple questions, answering a few simple questions on the needs that you have. So of course, we also have our network partners, whether it's the trade associations or our engagement partners, the NUS Enterprise, as well as some of the VCs and government-backed equity funds who can also help entrepreneurs navigate that rather complex and, and opaque like, landscape. After having spent time in emerging markets, uh, I certainly wish more governments were like Singapore. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, and I, 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 I just don't mean to toot our own country's horn, but I think we we'll always rank either number one or if, if not number two on the ease of doing business index. Yes, uh, yes. And I guess one big change is that Singapore is becoming an interesting place for foreign founders to set up shop or to set up their headquarters or initial base of operations. Hmm. How do you see this change the work, the nature of the work at PEP? Oh, actually, we welcome talent. We welcome all these entrepreneurs to come and set up in Singapore. They bring diversity to our business uh, community and also innovation. They enrich the innovation landscape here. So in fact, having a global outlook and having experience in different markets actually is a very key success factor uh, for many businesses. So PEP does not differentiate between local and foreign entrepreneurs. Uh, as long as you have a good business idea that is based in Singapore, uh, we will be happy to help you. So one good example of a foreign entrepreneur actually who, who anchored himself in Singapore is uh, Julian Atope, the founder of Zenium. Uh, so I think they're most famous for their invisible braces. Yeah, so I think he uh, has had vast experiences in many parts of the world, uh, Europe, Asia, Africa. He was even in, within Asia, he was in KL and now in Singapore. And through these unique experiences, he was able to build up a business model that actually caters to the needs of the dental needs of the current generation of people in Singapore. And it came in especially useful during COVID like, because he does teddy consulting and all that. But because it is a new business format where he partners dental clinics so as to offer those invisible braces at an affordable cost and using telemedicine consultation services for dental issues arising from the usage of braces, but because it's a new business model, they actually encountered difficulties in defining the liabilities of the company and their partner clinics because treatment plans were offered via their app and the company was not recognized as a healthcare provider by MOH and the Singapore Dental Council. So we actually met Zenium, I think, in 2019 when they participated in the PEP clinic organized by the Action Community of Entrepreneurship. So PEP worked closely with Zenium, MOH, and SDC to clarify some of these issues that were very unique to an intermediary kind of a telemedicine service provider. So these engagements have enabled Zenium to carry out their services without being restricted by MOH and SDD guidelines. So since then, I think the company has grown very well. In fact, many of my, even my colleagues in the team have used their products, say braces or electric toothbrush or some other dental products. We certainly welcome more entrepreneurs like Julian to come to Singapore to set up shop here. And the PP will be happy to walk the journey with them. Fantastic, man. It's certainly been an enjoyable stint for me over the past year and a half serving on the PP. Now we've come to the rapid fire round where I ask you a question and you give me a short answer. So uh, I'll start. Uh, Liu Chen, if you were to be invited to produce a Netflix series, what would be the title of the show? Maybe Barrier Breakers, because that is the mission and the spirit of uh, the PEP. So we want to showcase the, maybe the growth journey of some of our local startups, their experiences, their successes, as well as failures and lessons learned, so that they can inspire more people, especially our young people, to pursue entrepreneurship as a career option. That's actually a good idea. We should, we should send a Netflix to produce a PEP show. <laughs> <laughs> And a second question, looking back now and after having spent in uh, MTI and Shell, what is a skill, soft or hard skill that you wish you have learned as a student? So I really wish when I was in SEC 1, when we were asked to choose a third language, I had chosen Bahasa instead of French. Ah. Yeah, because back then when you're in your young days, everybody wants to study something fancy, right? Whether it's French or German. Uh, I think nowadays Japanese and Korean are also very popular. But I think they are really useless uh, when you start working. Mostly useless. Uh, whereas things like Bahasa or, or even some dialects will be much more useful in the regional context. And especially Bahasa, which I think they are huge growth markets with very big potential. And uh, it captures a large part of our regional population as well. So that's one Regret, I would say that I thought I, it would have been better if I made a different decision back then. That's great news because I forced all my three kids to take Bahasa Indonesia. Oh, language. is it? Okay. They complain every dinner. <laughs> but now I, I can quote what you said and tell them you have turned out very well. <laughs> uh, third question, if with the advent of uh, chat GPT, if there's hmm. something you could automate in your job just by wishing for it, what aspect for your role would that be? Maybe not chat GPT per se, uh, but... If, if Insignia can go and invest in an autonomous vehicle company that can drive me from home to work every day and automate that part of my work journey, that will be fantastic. I absolutely hate driving. <laughs> that is the most stressful part of my work every day. <laughs> that sounds like the robo-taxis that uh, we <laughs> yes. uh, will we'll eventually launch at some point in time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, that's great. Next question. 
what's your favorite go-to destination, uh, holiday destination in Southeast Asia? And uh, which trip are you most excited to take in the region? So I would say my favorite place is still Singapore because nothing beats home. But if you're really looking for something outside of Singapore, I would say maybe nowadays I travel a little bit, a little bit more to Indonesia. So I visited the Komodo Islands last year and I'm planning for a trip to uh, Sumba Island later this year. Uh, they have amazing natural scenery and also very diverse culture. It's very interesting. I just need to be careful not to get diarrhea, that's all. <laughs> yeah, that's important. <laughs> How we like, to find out what's your favorite go-to destination? That's a good question. Actually, it's just our natural parks, well, our nature parks, because ah. uh, during COVID, one of the things we do every day is to bring the family or, or friends to do walks. Mm. And we still do that, actually. We, uh, I think okay. for the founders that are not in Singapore, one of the great things you should spend on the weekends in Singapore is to go through uh, our connectors and go through our nature parks, which is quite splendid and quite well maintained. So last question, what is your favorite activity to de-stress? Okay, I think nothing can beat a long work-free holiday. <laughs> <laughs> so, so where there is good scenery, good food, good company, but no laptop. <laughs> Okay, we, you should tell your minister that. <laughs> on, on, on that note, thank you so much, Liu Chen, for being on our show. I'm sure a lot of our audience who have not heard of PEP are now interested. And I, I would encourage you to write in the PEP because there's actually a lot of interesting ideas being proposed. And some of them that get approved actually turn out to benefit the public. And you can build a nice business out of it. And it's actually very rewarding. A lot of our founders that I met that benefited from PEP, like Drive Life, you mentioned, like Zenium founders, they're very thankful for the scheme. So thanks for telling our audience about the PEP and also sharing a bit about our background. I really enjoyed the chat. Thank you. England, thank you. Thank you for joining us on this call. Make sure you get notified on when to dial in by following us wherever you're listening to us. If you're on YouTube, hit that subscribe button, toss in a like, and let us know if you'd like to hear more of this topic in the comments. See you all in our next call.